Welcome. This is the Cisco CCNA ENSA, also known as the Enterprise Networking Security and Automation course. This course focuses on the CCNA version 7 curriculum. This is course 3 of 3. Module 9, QoS Concepts. So in this module, we're going to be talking about quality of uh, network transmissions, traffic characteristics, queuing algorithms, different QoS models, and implementation techniques. So let's go ahead and jump right on in. So let's look at network transmission quality. So inside the Netacad uh, system, they do have some of the videos which they like to put up in our PowerPoints, which I'm not covering the video. I'm just going to quickly explain what QoS is. QoS is essentially a way to prioritize traffic. If the router is feeling overwhelmed and it can only process one packet and two packets show up, which packet should it forward? Which packet should it process? Without QoS, first come, first serve. However, with QoS, we can look at certain things like class of traffic. Is it a, a real-time traffic protocol? Is it something like voice or video? Something that has a real-time component? Or is it just regular data that can take an extra millisecond to be displayed? So the nice thing is normally UDP uses is used for our real-time traffic. TCP with it being connection oriented, being guaranteed delivery, the additional overhead is normally connection oriented and is not really suitable for real time traffic. So we can prioritize maybe off of protocol type or we can actually look at protocol header information and that will define certain QoS features. All right, so in Wikipedia, we can see a pretty common IPv4 header and we can see right here, we have this TOS. Different view, same thing, IP header. The TOS was replaced by this DSCP. DSCP is essentially, again, originally defined as TOS, but this basically was a differentiated service or a diff service. That's what QoS is. So, like I said before, it, it allows us to prioritize traffic. And I, again, I understand that it processing one packet is unrealistic, but when it, a networking device, a router or a switch is getting swarmed with data and it has a ton of low priority, medium priority and high priority traffic, it's still going to send out low and medium priority. However, it's going to prioritize the higher ones first. So you may get two or three high priority packets for every one low quality packet. That way, the majority of the network traffic will be that high priority. And what ends up happening is the device, typically a router, will uh, queue the incoming information. Basically, the queues are just, they hold them. And when they're able to send them, then they send them. So by querying the packets caused a delay, that's one of the negative issues with them because newer packets then cannot be transmitted until previous packets have been processed. So as we start uh, queuing these larger strings of packets, they become more and more of a delay because again, we're, we're essentially, we're building up this bucket. We're, we're collecting these packets waiting to be sent and they're not being sent for whatever reason, normally limited bandwidth. Well, the issue is, all of that causes additional delay. It gets to the point where if the number of packets to be uh, queried continues to increase, the memory of the device also then starts being filled up. Once the resources of that device are filled, they start dropping packets. So one way to, uh, to fix this again is querying uh, traffics, uh, looking at the cra uh, traffic characteristics and prioritizing what type of traffic should be sent first. And that's part of what that prioritization is. So what's the big deal? I mean, how does this get used real world? Well, 
real world, I mean, even with 100 meg, 200 meg, 400 meg plus con uh, internet connection, keep in mind, business is slightly different from home internet. So the same speeds that a home user get are not what a business would be getting. I pay for a gigabit home connection and I have a 200 uh, megabit business connection. My business connection is three times the price of my gigabit home internet. With that said, I have to prioritize certain types of traffic over that business line. I do a lot of large data transferring, but I also do a lot of voice. So I prioritize all voice traffic first. That means the majority of the data sent first on the business connection will be voice. The data can actually take a back seat. The voice has a real-time component that I need to be concerned about. And again, some of the reasons are going to be things like aggregation, speed mismatching, uh, LAN to WAN. Again, you may have a gigabit LAN connection, but then it has to filter out through whatever internet connection you have. Again, 100 megabit, 200 megabit, and so forth. These are all main reasons that transmission quality may go down. So what is this jitter? When we talk about voice, jitter is going to be the more like robotic talk that you may hear while dealing with voice. Jitter is noise on the wire that actually is dealing with interference or delay of that voice packet being sent. Other things could be like network congestion. The sad fact is with streaming technologies now, especially in the business, more and more people are consuming network resources by streaming music and, and YouTube and whatnot, even though it's not business related. The business has a network and that network only has a limited amount of speed. So sometimes poor design plays a huge part of not enough bandwidth to have the organization run correctly. All right, so let's dive a little bit deeper into that delay. So delay or latency basically refers to the time it takes for a packet to travel from the source to the destination. Normally, there's a fixed delay is the amount of time so that's, uh, that specific processing takes, such as how long it takes to place a bit on the transmission media. That's all fixed, like we know that. However, there is a variable delay. Basically, this is an unspecified amount of time that is affected by factors such as traffic processing, traffic over the wire, and uh, media transmission issues that are outside the norm. And again, the textbook definition of jitter is going to be that the variation of delay of the received packets. Not just the sent packets, but received packets. So we can see that we have a few other forms of delay, like a code delay, a packetization delay, a queuing delay, a serialization delay, a propagation delay, and a de-jitter delay. You guys can read the descriptions of each of those. We always assume that a network has the appropriate amount of bandwidth, but realistically, if it is not planned for, then equipment normally does not. I've actually seen more recently, in 2020, 2021, and so forth, that they still sell 10, 100 uh, megabits per second based equipment. And I still see businesses implementing 10, 100 megabits per second uh, equipment. I actually just seen a business buy three new switches where the 10, 100 was cheaper than the gigabit. But no one thought about, you know, long-term investment of that equipment. The gigabit was, you know, $50 more expensive per piece of equipment, but the likelihood of that equipment lasting over the next five years, well, the 10100 probably won't, where the gigabit probably would. So when we're talking delay, we have to look at how the network is set up, the type of traffic on the network, and then we need to look at the traffic itself. Are we actually consuming the majority of the bandwidth on the network? So if we are assuming there is some type of delay 
and queuing happening, there could be packet loss because of those features. If it has to queue and the memory is filled, eventually packet loss will occur. So without some form of QoS mechanism, time-sensitive packets, again, real-time traffic or uh, voice video, uh, could be dropped at the same frequency as regular traffic. Again, real-time traffic has a real-time component, which means they need to be given priority. But if they are given the same priority of like a website, for example, then they run the risk of being treated like a regular data packet, not one that has a certain level of priority. Again, the importance of that is priority is essentially saying, oh, this has a real-time component, it needs to go first. So if the jitter is so large that it can cause packets to be received out of a range of the uh, play or buffer order, out of range packets, essentially they are discarded. So losses for a small amount, like maybe a single packet, a digital signal processor, DSP, will uh, basically interpret what's going on and play back that type of audio. Realistically, this happens pretty common and you don't normally notice the difference. However, the more jitter occurs, the harder this DSP process it is to interpret what should be going next. So you start end up, uh, ending up with portions of a uh, sound clipper, voice call, or video that sync and uh, mouth is moving without audio, or there is like a, a half a second delay. Uh, one of the more funny commercials that I've seen lately is a guy taking an elevator and he's calling out for help, but everything is offset by five seconds. So that's what it's mean by, by jitter, that offset in audio quality, that offset in audio response, so that someone actually cannot understand or interpret what is going on. All right, let's move on to traffic characteristics. So looking at network traffic trends, basically early 2000s, predominant IP was uh, voice and data, phone calls and web uh, web content. So to look at those characteristics, the voice had a predictable bandwidth need and a realistic round trip uh, travel time. Data traffic wasn't real time, so it wasn't really that important. It was unpredictable in bandwidth needs also. So data traffic could be temporarily bursted with larger files being downloaded. That burst essentially means it could go really fast and slow, then fast, then slow. That way, in between the faster bursts, they could jam pack other type of traffic. But however, more recently, it's becoming increasingly important for businesses to actually be able to provide basic communication and operations. So according to the Cisco Visual Networking Index, the VNI, video traffic represented about 70% of all traffic in 2017. By 2022, video traffic is supposed to be 82%. So video being both uh, voice and uh, voice audio and a visual component. Uh, essentially things like YouTube and other streaming services. They're going to be the majority of traffic on the internet. Mobile video traffic is going to be reaching 60.9 extra bytes per month in 2022. Again, consuming visual and audio based video content uh, either through a, a mobile device or through a regular device on a data network. That means the type of demands that voice and video are putting on the network are very different than traffic. So when we're looking at the characteristics, those real-time components need to be able to be given a higher priority but at the same time, we still need to be able to balance it between regular data and traffic with a real-time component. All right, so let's go and let's look at voice. Voice traffic is predictable and smooth and very sensitive to delay and the jitter. Again, we do not want a voice to be cut off in the middle of a conversation. So traffic uh, characteristics. We want smooth. We want it to be drop sensitive or delay sensitive. We want to be able to give it a certain level of priority. 
So there are specific requirements for a voice. That is going to be latency has to be less than or equal to 150 microseconds. I meant milliseconds, not microseconds. The second microseconds popped up in my head, you could, you could notice that I paused. Anyway, uh, jitter has to be less than 30 milliseconds. And there has to be a total loss of less than 1%. Bandwidth needs to be about 30 to 128 uh, kilobits per second per voice call. You have a call center with 100 people, it's not going to be 128 kilobits per second. It's going to be the bandwidth for each uh, individual phone call added up. With video, and it can be uh, bursty, though the traffic characteristic is it's very greedy in bandwidth. It also is drop and delay sensitive, and it also has a certain level of priority. Normally, with voice, it will use UDP ports such as uh, 554. This is the real time streaming protocol, uh, RSTP. Latency should be less than 400 milliseconds. Jitter can be between 30 and 50 milliseconds. Loss, it can have a lot more loss than voice, but loss is going to be between 0.1 and 1% or less. And you'll notice that bandwidth is definitely drastically increased. Bandwidth is going to be per instance 384 kilobits per second through 20 megabits, but really just depends. If you're trying to stream uh, an HD video, bandwidth consumption is going to be more. If you're trying to stream a 4K video, again, bandwidth is going to be greatly increased. So when we're looking at a network, if we're designing the network, we have to look at current characteristics and what are we going to be doing for growth what's going to be allowed on that network and if there are going to be any type of filtering one of the uh, jobs i work at they actually limit uh, video content like youtube and they uh, drop it down to a very low bandwidth that way you cannot stream hd you cannot stream constantly that way they can actually uh reserve some of that bandwidth for other applications. Anyways, so moving forward, we have our data. This is going to be type of any type of uh, actual uh, application type data, FTP or HTTP or HTTPS, uh, DHCP or DNS. This is going to be the actual data that a user is going to be uh, using. It can be smooth, it can be bursty, doesn't really matter. It can be benign, it could be greedy. Uh, again, it doesn't really matter. It's drop insensitive and it's delay insensitive. Most of the time, data is going to be transmitted over F, um, over TCP. So if there is an issue, it just retransmits. So like FTP, for example, if a packet isn't received, big deal, retransmit. It may consume more bandwidth, but it doesn't matter that delay in the receiving an additional packet is not that big of an issue. So since we said that data is relatively insensitive, does that mean it doesn't matter? It really, it does matter. There is a quality of experience or QOE, and it basically it's the other important consideration with data traffic. Basically it means is does the data come from a interactive application? Is the data mission critical? If the data does come from an interactive application, that delay does matter. For example, let's say you're working in a database program and you're inputting data. And in order for you to hit enter, the program has to accept that data. If there is too much delay, then the users may get frustrated. So if it is a mission critical application, that and uh, that insensitive, that interactive uh, capability may lead to additional frustrations. That slower uh, response time could be an issue. Normally, that's why they want you to strive for like a second-ish response time. If it's not mission critical, then again, you can lower the requirements and users just have to deal with it. If it's a, not an interactive program, the delay can vary because 
it really all depends on when the program needs to actually receive that data. If there is nothing that the, inter uh, that the user is interacting with, then it may not be considered as important. All right, so let's talk about our queuing algorithms. So there are a few different types of queuing algorithms. First in, first out, weighted fair queuing, class-based weighted fair queuing, and low latency queuing. I know it says video, but again, we're just going to talk about all of them. So queuing overview. Basically, with QoS, we could do a policy. So essentially, what ends up happening is when we have a QoS policy, it will be implemented when uh, an, act, an, an actual network admin decides to, to implement it. However, it may not always be active. It becomes active when there's congestion that's occurring on the link. And so what ends up happening is the, cre uh, the queuing is going to be a congestion management tool that can be uh, set certain criteria, things like buffer prioritization and uh, reordering of packets if necessary. So again, the admin sets up the policy, but the device determines when it's going to be active or not. There are a few different L queuing algorithms that are used. First in, first out, weighted fair queuing, class-based, and low latency queuing are just some of the more common ones. So let's cover each one of these a little bit more in depth. So first in, first out. So basically, first in, first out queuing buffers and forwards packets in the order that they arrive. There is no prioritization. Whatever came in first, that's what goes out first, and so forth. The nice thing is basically everything is treated as equal. So the packets are sent out the interface in which the order they are received. So ingress and they uh, egress the same order. The negative with that is what happens if there is a lower or a different priority? Well, uh, FIFO doesn't really work like that. So we have a weighted fair queuing. This is more of an automated scheduling method that provides more fair bandwidth. They will create buckets, essentially. And when enough pa uh, packets come to fill a bucket in the ingress section, it will dump it and it will allow for egress. While the buckets for the lower priority traffic is a little bit larger, meaning it's going to only send when that uh, container reaches a certain level. So the higher packet, the higher um, priority packets, have a much smaller bucket. That way they're going to be dumped and be allowed to egress a little quicker. And again, buckets are just, or containers are just a concept here. Basically, uh, we wait till there's a threshold, and once that threshold is met, send it on its way. That way it can collect. And that way, when we're doing this, if we're receiving a ton of traffic, we can weight them accordingly. We also have what's called a class-based weighting affair system. This basically looks at our WFQ and expands it. We can look at traffic classes that are defined in match criteria, uh, protocols, ACLs, input interfaces, and so forth. We could do packet uh, satisfying the match criteria for forwarding. We could do a FIFO query, uh, query is reserved for each class and traffic belonging to a specific class. And we can also look at a class that can be assigned characteristics, such as bandwidth, weight, and maximum pa uh, packet transmit limits. This basically will assound, uh, assign bandwidth to a class that's guaranteed bandwidth delivery. So it is, it's always funny when I read that. Guaranteed bandwidth delivery. Bandwidth is X amount of a resource. Well, you can over allocate that bandwidth. You can do guaranteed bandwidth delivery, but that means that bandwidth now is then sectioned off for only a specific set of uh, channel. The problem with that is if nothing is on that channel, then what happens when the other uh, prioritization packets are coming in? that need that extra bandwidth. Well, if it's guaranteed, it can't be used for anyone other than what's destined on that channel. So there's some issues there. So here we have different classes. We have class one, two, three, and these are all user-defined. 
And again, what we do is we prioritize them. And as we get data coming in, we fill them into classes, containers, and then we forward them out when that class gets filled. So the tail will drop discard any packets that are arriving at the tail end of a query that has completely uh, used up its packet holding resource. Again, the packet holding are just what we call classes. When they get filled up, they get sent. We also have what's called a low latency queuing, LLQ. This feature brings strict priority queuing to our CBWFQs. Have to love the amount of acronyms when we talk about our queuing. Essentially what we do is we do our classes, but we also now have a priority queue. And the priority queue allows us to set very specific class priorities that will be sent ahead of our WFQs. Basically, if it is flagged as voice or video or the most important, when it looks at its queue and it looks at the WFQ, it is always going to send the priority queue first and then it will send the WFQ. And with the WFQ, it will look at the user defined class one, two, and three before forwarding it on. So that was kind of some of the queuing methods in a nutshell. Again, very basic level, nothing super in depth, because at this level, we're not expecting you to know QoS in depth. QoS used to be its own strict course, and now it's not. So moving on, let's talk about our QoS models. We have three main models. We have our best effort model. We have our integrated services, or InserV. And we have our differentiated services, our diff serve. And this is a short video inside Netacad if you want to go through the models. Otherwise, we're going to talk about these on our next slide. So how do you figure out which policy model to actually implement? Again, best effort, int serve, or diff serve. Well, each of them have a very specific set of criteria to uh, meet. So we're going to look at these three models in a little bit more depth. So best effort, basically this is the more basic of the designs, and this is how the internet was designed. Best effort packet delivery, and it provides no guarantees. Again, we're looking at more UDP-based weights. So the best effort treats all network packets in the same way, so an emergency voice message is treated as a photo or an email. So best effort basically means no guarantee, it will try. That's it. In the easiest and quickest model to deploy, but that means critical data is treated as everything else. We have our integrated services, and this will deliver end-to-end -end QoS in a real-time application uh, requiring it. It basically explicitly manages network resources to provide QoS to very uh, specific channel flows or streams. These are also known as microflows. User uh, resources, preservation, and administration mechanisms are the building blocks of that QoS. Again, the ability to manage those resources and understanding which packets to process are the, the, the backbone. They are the most important. So using resource reservation and administration, you can control the flow of traffic. Using a connection-oriented approach, each individual communication must explicitly specify its traffic description and request resources on the network. This may also uh, increase a certain level of management of the network, but this is management allows the network to run a little bit more efficiently. So we basically have the QoS aware nodes that have to request access to the network. The edge devices will perform admission control to ensure the availability of resources and to make sure that the network uh, function is sufficient to support the new uh, components coming in. In the InServ model, the application requesting a specific kind of uh, resource or service from the network before sending its data. There are some benefits. One of the nice things is the InServe will use the resource reservation protocol, 
RSVP to signal QoS needs uh, application uh, requirements. The benefit is explicit end-to-end -end resource administration control, better overall management of QoS. It does a per request policy admission, and it will signal for dynamic port numbers. However, drawbacks are the complexity of implementation. Flow base is not very scalable, and it's very resource intense due to the stateful architecture requirements. Basically, every time a device needs to use a network resource, it has to then pull the check requirements. Well, that creates a lot of overhead, a lot more management on the network that could lead to additional uh, congestion on the network. Moving on, we have our diffserve. And so with our diffserve model, it's a simple and scalable mechanism for classifying and man uh, managing our traffic. Basically, it doesn't matter if you are aware or aware of the network traffic. So if you're aware of it, great. If you're not aware of it, okay. You being unaware that you're sending voice doesn't matter because the networking components, the device components, are going to actually take the packets, look at its uh, packet header, and figure out from there how to function. It is not end-to-end -end QoS. It cannot enforce end-to-end -end, uh, QoS performance. When it is sent into a backbone, it's doing best effort. It's, it's trying. That's it. The host will forward traffic to a router. The router will flow into aggregates or classes. It provides the appropriate policy for those classes. And it will enforce and apply the QoS mechanism on that hop-by-hop -hop basis, uniformly applying the global meaning to each traffic class, provided the flexibility and scalability, but that also assumes that you own that backbone or that you've paid for a certain level of QoS on AISP's backbone. And it's going to be based off of the different classes. So DiffServ provides network traffic into classes. And those classes can be class 1, 2, 3, could be class 1, 2. It kind of just depends on how many levels you want. It is very scalable and it provides several different class levels, but again, there's no guarantee of service quality. And it does also require a complex mechanism to work in a connect throughout the entire network, but this is probably the more widely used QoS mechanism that is being deployed. So let's go ahead and let's look at exactly that, the implementation of QoS techniques. All right, so how do we avoid packet loss? Well, packet loss is usually the result of congestion on a interface. While some applications that use TCP will experience slowdown because of, again, the connection-oriented uh, function of TCP, it, it having to retransmit and stuff like that, TCP cannot handle drops uh, as easily because it will go through its entire process. With UDP, a drop is just ignored and they move forward. So the following approaches can prevent drops in more sensitive applications. The first one is the easiest. Increase link capacity. If you have a 10 megabit per second switch, get rid of it. Get a newer link. Uh, 100 megabit, gigabit, whatever. Maybe implement some form of bonding technology so that you can double the bandwidth by bonding two links together, assuming you have two links that are compatible. You can implement some form of bandwidth uh, through QoS, through like bursting technologies. You, things like uh, WFQ or CBWFQ or LLQ, Things that can guarantee bandwidth delivery. You can also start implementing a dropper lower priority packets before the congestion occurs. In the Cisco IOS, QoS does provide queuing mechanisms such as some form of early detection, weighted random functionality. That starts dropping lower priority packets before the congestion actually occurs. The problem with that is drop packets with TCP 
does mean that it's going to send more packets. So some of the other tools are things like uh, classification and marketing tools, congestion avoidance tools, that's going to be things like traffic classes, uh, setting up the appropriate policies, and looking at any type of avoidance tool that you can implement. We also have what's called congestion management tools. And this is normally happening when the traffic will exceed the appropriate availability of those resources. Meaning, you may have a 100 megabit link, but you're trying to send, you know, 120, 130 continuously. The problem with that is traffic is being queued and awaiting the availability of that resource. So it now having a backlog could start impacting the performance of that link. Not that it could, but that it does. Looking at upgrading those links are typically the best way of resolving that issue. So we have a few different ways, classification and marketing, uh, marking, not marketing. We have our uh, congestion avoidance and we have our congestion management. And each one of these can be grouped specific ways. So you'll see in this figure that ingress packets are classified into their respective header mark, uh, markers, classifying, marking, policies, queuing, scheduling, and shaping. And that way you can prioritize the egress function. So the packets that are queued and forwarded at the egress interface based on their defined QoS shaping and uh, policy, um, policying policy, that way they can ensure a certain level of guaranteed delivery. So let's look at this classification and marketing, the collision avoidance and congestion management a little bit more in depth. Classification and marketing, basically before a packet can have a QoS policy applied to it, the packet has to be classified. Again, we can have X amount of number of classifications that are user defined. The classification will determine the class of traffic to which that frame belongs. Only after traffic is marked can a policy be applied to it. Is it marked voice? Is it marked real time? Is it marked low priority? That's what it means by marking. So how a packet is classified will depend on the implementation. So methods for classifying traffic uh, flow for both layer three and layer two could include things like interfaces, ACLs, and class maps. Traffic can also be classified layers four through seven using the network-based application recognition or NBAR. It all depends on the type of router that you have set up and the features that are there for QoS. So the traffic will be marked usually depending on the technology that is in use. The decision of whether to mark traffic in layer two or layer three is not trivial and should be made after considering the several key points. Layer two, marking of a frame, performance for non-IP traffic. And that means QoS options are only going to be looking at the frame. Where if you're doing layer three, marking will carry out the QoS information end to end and be looking specifically at layer three data. So QoS tools like in 802.1Q, that's gonna be looking at layer two it's going to be dealing with the class of service, the COS. If we are dealing with uh, 802.11, that's also layer two, that's going to be using its wireless traffic identifier, the TID. If you're looking at MPLS, that's going to be the experimental. If we're looking at IPv4, or IPv6, that's all going to be done at layer three, and that's going to be looking at the IP precedence, the IPP, or different differentiated service code points, the DSCPs. Uh, interesting part here with the DSCPs, that does require more bits for our QoS function. So let's go ahead, let's look at this a little bit more in depth. With our QoS tool for our 802.1Q, you will see that we have a TPID which sets a priority, a CFI, and a VLAN ID. Well, the priority is actually the three bits used for our QoS. Sorry, our class of service, not our QoS, but our CFOS. That COS is part of the QoS features at this layer. 
So what are some of the COS values? Well, there's eight bits options. So there are zero through seven. And again, best effort, medium, high priority, call signaling, video conferencing, voice bearing, or reserved options. These allow us to flag that bit accordingly. If we're doing marking at layer three, for example, we are looking at the type of service. If we're looking at an IPv6 header, it's still traffic class, but it's still essentially the same as type of service. With the types of service and traffic classes, basically the carrying packet marking as assigned by the QoS classification. This is done through the differentiated service code point, the DSCP field. These six bits will offer a maximum of 64 possible classes. So when we're looking at classes, we can have the different classes set up and you can define what types of classes. There are 64 possible classes. The remaining two bits are called the IP extended congestion notification, ECN bits, and they can only be used by ECN aware routers. And this allows marking of packets instead of dropping them. Again, way outside the scope of CCNA, but this is just background of understanding QoS and how we should prioritize traffic and the functions of prioritization. So the DSCP values, we have again, there are 64 DSCP values, best effort, uh, expanded forwarding or EF, and essentially that's going to be a DSCP decimal value of 46 or binary value of 1011103. The first three bits map directly to the layer two COS value, and the other remaining five are used for voice traffic. At layer three, Cisco would recommend the EF only be used to mark voice packets for now. There's also the assured forwarding section, AF, and this will define the use of the five most significant DSCP bits to indicate query instead of drop preferences. So if we're looking at these, here we have our classes, and then we have our drops, our low drops, medium drops, and high drops. And we can record them based off of classes and assured forwarding values. So the assured forwarding values are shown in the figure. The AFXY formula is specified as following. The first three most significant bits are used to designate the class. If it's class four, the best query and class one is the worst query. So class four is going to be the best option. The fourth and fifth most significant bits are gonna be used to designate the drop preference, while the sixth bit is going to be set to zero. Let me grab my pen. So again, class, is this class one, two, three, or four? And then we have our drop preference. And then the last one will just be set to a straight zero. That way we can define which class we are going to be put in, class four being the highest, and which drop category we're gonna be in, low drop, medium drop, high drop. So for our class selector bits, also known as CS bits, the three most significant bits of the DSCP field and indicate the individual class. We already knew that from the previous slide. These will map directly to the three bits of the COS field in the IPP field to maintain the compatibility with 802.1p as well as RFC 791. Again, way more depth than you actually need to know. This was more of a just understanding the background of how QoS functions and understanding that there is a very specific standard set to be used. We also have what's called a trust boundary. Our trust boundaries should be classified and marked as close to the source uh, technically as possible or as feasible. These will define the trust boundaries, basically trusted endpoints, secured endpoints, and traffic can also be marked at the appropriate layer three switches or router level. That way we can understand the type of traffic coming in and we can trust what they are. So we need to back up a few. We have to talk about congestion of avoidance. Uh, congestion avoidance tools 
we've already talked about with some of the preemptive tools. Basically, this allows us to monitor the network traffic load in an effort to anticipate the uh, congestion to avoid them. They'll monitor the network load in an effort to anticipate, maybe avoid the congestion. They will basically perform some form of bottlenecking before it becomes a problem. They will monitor the average depth of the uh, queues in use, and when the queues are below the minimum threshold, they start dropping packets. As these queues fill up the maximum threshold, a small percentage of packets will be dropped. They can filter all of this before they are dropped, before they are reaching that device. They do that through the WRED. This will allow for the congestion avoidance function to kick in. The WRED helps avoid tail drops and maximize network performance and really utilize TCP based applications and improve that performance. Again, with TCP, it's connection oriented. So when a TCP packet is dropped, an acknowledgement is not received, so it will generate more traffic. But it's more about controlling when the packets are dropped. That way we can funnel or bottleneck them before they get to a device that is really slammed with its resources. One of the last major sections are shaping and policies. Because again, traffic can be all over the place. If we're shaping the traffic, we can get a nice steady stream of traffic. And that's the point of our shaping. So the traffic shaping will retain excess packets in a queue and then schedule the excess for later transmission over an increment of time. This allows us to have a smooth packet output. Shaping is an outbound concept. And again, all it really does is it starts queuing the packets so that we can have a smooth signal being sent. Policy is applied to the inbound traffic on an interface. So policing is commonly implemented by service providers to enforce a contracted information rate or a CIR. However, the service provider may also allow bursting over that speed. If you ever wonder why when you get like 100 megabit speed and you do a speed test, you get 150. Well, those are burst speeds. You can get a little bit above what you're paying for. However, when you look at the data transmission rate over a given period of time, it should be averaging out to what you are paying for. Sometimes it can burst above, sometimes it's below, but on average, it's staying the same. So when we're looking at our policy guidelines, essentially we must consider the full path source to destination that we control. A few guidelines basically enable queuing at every device in the path, classify and mark traffic as close to the source as possible, and shape and policy traffic flows as close to their source as possible. So that's actually it for this chapter. We talked about a ton of different material. We looked at voice video, looking at how they implement with QoS. We looked at types of QoS. We looked at delays, uh, fixed and variable. We looked at bursty traffic, greedy traffic, queuing types, uh, FIFO, weighted fair queuing, queuing of priorities, weights, containers. We looked at diff serve and at uh, int serve. We looked at how we can do congestion using ACLs. We looked at categorization of QoS tools, classification, marketing, congestion, and congestion management tools. We looked at how we can classify traffic flows, layer two, layer three, layers four through seven using NBAR. And we looked at some forms of weighted random early detection to kind of tunnel traffic in. And that is it for this chapter. Thank you. If you have any questions or anything, please feel free to reach out. Again, with this material, being able to ask questions and discuss some of the topics in the lecture help build long-term retention. So do not be afraid to, to communicate with this topic. Again, I'm here if you need anything. Thank you.